Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. So today is the end of my series that I've been doing for months about God's will. I tell you, I've been really excited about this because it's when I found out what God's will for my life was and I began to pursue it that my entire life changed. God has a perfect plan for every one of you watching this program. And I believe that very few people have discovered God's will. Even fewer people are following God's will. And then there will be very few people that learn how to fulfill and accomplish God's will. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not because God ordained it, but we just have an enemy that's coming against us and he's trying to stop God's plan collectively, but also individually. He's trying to mess up God's plan for your life. And very few people aggressively pursue God's plan. They just kind of float through life. You know, I've said this on a number of occasions as we've gone through this series, but an old dead fish can float downstream. It takes some life, effort, for you to turn around and swim against the current, to go against what everybody else is doing. And that's the way you have to be in order to fulfill God's will. It takes effort. You have to seek God. So I've been talking on this for months, and today is my very last day. If you've missed any of this teaching, I encourage you to please get it. You'll need to hear this again many, many times. I really believe that. And also, what a great thing to share with other people. You know, if you have children, if you have friends, if you know anybody who's breathing, God has a plan for them. And very few people have figured it out. And this series will help them to discover and follow and then fulfill God's will. Today's the end of that teaching. I've been using just a number of scriptures. I've already in this last teaching on how to fulfill God's will, I've talked about the importance of imagination. I've shared from scripture that hope is just a positive imagination. And hope is what we're saved by. Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Hope is the conceptual stage of faith. And just as a baby has to be conceived and carried for a period of time before the baby is born, hope is the conceptual and carrying stage of faith. And then when it comes to maturity, it produces faith. And then faith produces the miracle that we're believing God for. So we have to have a strong hope. And I've just been reading lots of scriptures. I was reading some about how that hope produces happiness. And, you know, there's more on that. I'm going to skip on through because today's my last day to deal with this. Let me just make a point here. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. The word deferred means just put off, prolonged. In other words, you don't realize it. Uh, Maybe you had a goal of accomplishing something in one week's time or whatever, and if it doesn't come to pass in that amount of time, then it makes your heart sick. In other words, hope deferred. If you have a hope and it doesn't come to pass, boy, this just makes your heart sick. It makes, it's discouraging. It's depressing. And you know, this is um, what's happened to a lot of people. A lot of people have set unrealistic goals. You know, I'm not completely against goal setting. I have goals. God has shown me things. And so, yes, I have goals. But I think it's dangerous for us to just arbitrarily say that, you know, a year from now, this is where I'm going to be, five years from now. I have people all of the time that are trying to get me to establish deadlines. And they're saying, all right, so where are we going to be a year from now? And there's a lot of people that teach that you're supposed to have a five-year plan. I have goals. I know where I'm going. I know what God's telling me to do. But you know what? I am... I avoid anchoring it to a date and saying that at this time we're going to do something. Now, we're in the process of building a campus for our Bible college because we've just outgrown here. And I believe that God is turning Karis Bible College into a major force. We right now have around 500 people in our school. I believe that in a few years we're going to have 3,000 And to accommodate that and the dormitory space and all of the things that it takes, you know, what? we've acquired some property and we're in the process. And because I'm advertising this to our partners, I've said that it was a 40 month process. That means that somewhere around uh, 2013, 
I'm expecting to move in there because we've talked to the builder and to the permit process and the architects, and this is about what it would take. If we just had the go-ahead and all the money we need, it would be about a 40-month process. From now, it'd be, it'd be less than that. And so I have put some times to it, but you know what? They aren't set in stone. This is just an approximation. It's something so that we can tell other people about it. But you know, if something was to happen, And if I didn't accomplish it in 2013 and if it took until 2014 or 2015, that's not necessarily what I want. But I have avoided just saying, thus saith the Lord that we're going to be in there in 2013 because I can't say that. There's a lot of things. There's, you know, weather could affect things. The way that the money comes in affects things. And so uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I'm aware of this and because of it, I have goals, but I very seldom set deadlines on it. I'll do it sometimes really for other people to motivate other people and to let them see the importance and that, you know, I'm, I'm now 61. And I hadn't got 40 years to be doing this. And so there are some time things, but they're very vague. It's, I think it's important for you to have goals of like, for instance, you're going to be healed. But for you to say, I'm going to not leave this meeting until I'm healed. Boy, you're setting yourself up for some discouragement. If Abraham would have done that and says, I've been waiting 10 years. All right, this year, I'm going to see the promises of God come to pass. He would have missed it. It took 26 years from the time that he entered into the land of Israel or at that time it's called the the promised land or this uh, land of Canaan, it took 26 years from the time he entered in until he saw his child born. And if he would have just arbitrarily said, all right, next year I'm believing. You know what? He could have been made his heart sick. He could have missed out on the things of God. You need to be careful in setting goals because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Here's a scripture that I really like. It says, For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Basically, here's the way that we would say that in modern day language. If you're breathing, there's still hope. A live dog is better than a dead lion. If you, you know, if you are alive, then there's still hope. If you're still breathing, then there's hope that God can turn it around. If you're believing for a financial miracle, if you're breathing there's reason for you to have hope. If you're believing for a physical healing, if you're still breathing, there's reason for you to have hope. Let all that hath breath praise the Lord. And so anyway, you need to start recognizing the power of hope. Let me give you some uh, negative examples of people that saw something in their imagination, but this, this is a negative imagination. One of the first ones that comes to mind is Elijah. And Elijah had operated in the power of God. He called for a drought. The drought came to pass. He was miraculously sustained. The widow woman that God led him to was miraculously sustained. Elijah saw the widow woman's son raised from the dead. This is all recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17. And I mean, it was powerful. And then in chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, he went back, called the entire nation together, called fire down out of heaven, and the entire nation of Israel turned to the Lord and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. It was a great revival, and He killed all of the prophets of Baal. He outran a chariot for over 20 miles with the chariot having a head start. Elijah was just operating and flowing in the power of God. But then Jezebel, the queen, when she heard about what he did, she sent a note to him in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2. It says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Elijah had just killed 850 prophets of Baal and prophets of the groves. And you can't kill 850 something people without you just being covered in blood. And what must this have been like to see 850 corpses just laying around that he had killed? What a vivid sight. What an impression that would make on your imagination. And so Jezebel sent a messenger with a note. If she, I believe she really wanted him dead, but she was 
the whole nation had turned to God and she was now out of control. And uh, if she really wanted to kill him, she would have sent a soldier with a sword and not a messenger with a note. So she was trying to intimidate him and she says, I'm going to make your life like the life of one of these prophets of mine that you killed. And look at this, 1 Kings 19, 3. When he saw that, when he saw what? He saw himself dead like one of those prophets that he had killed. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't, with a sword, cut somebody's head off, see their head roll down or something. He certainly saw bodies piled up. He had seen that, and when she sent this note, said, this is, I'm going to make you just like one of them. It says, when he saw that, he didn't see it with his physical eyes because he didn't die under the hand of Jezebel. So this isn't something that he saw with his eyes. He saw this in his heart. You know what? His imagination saw himself being killed by Jezebel. And when he saw it, what happened? He arose and went for his life. He ran. Here was the thing that he had been believing for. The thing that he was destined by God to do was to bring revival to Israel, to turn that nation back. And he had done it in a miraculous fashion, called fire down out of heaven. And the entire nation turned to God. They were in the midst of red hot revival. This is what he was born for. And because a woman threatened him with a note, he saw himself dead and he ran from this revival. And the nation who was ripe for the picking, I mean, this could have been hundreds of thousands of people whose lives could have turned to the Lord. They were ready. They were seeking God. And the one who God had ordained to use and to fulfill his will ran in the opposite direction. 